Holy Sonnet 14 by John Donne. Batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may rise and stand or throw me and bend your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like an usurped town, to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason, your viceroy in me, me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you, and would be loved fain, but am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me, for I accept you and thrall me. Never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Welcome to this week's edition of Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Brian Kozowski, and beside me is Ben Durant. Brian, it's so good to be back in the studio. Last week, we were away from the studio, and, you know, it's so good to be back where we belong. We apologize for any audio problems we may have had. Well, boy, this past week, part eight, it's a crazy, crazy episode. I was wrong about my predictions. (laughs) Some of my predictions were on Twitter. I was like... Cooper's going to wake up. Audrey's going to be on it. We're going to have music at the roadhouse. <laughs> so you're saying all this stuff, and something came to my mind, and I'll make this real quick. Way back in the day when South Park was uh, like really big, and it still is, but the height of its popularity, South Park did a big two-parter. Mm. They were going to say, who was Cartman's dad? Now, dun, it's, dun, a, dun. it's a stupid cartoon. You're like, who's going to be Cartman's dad? So... Next week, they say they're going to tell us who Cartman's dad is. Next week was a half-hour cartoon of Terrence and Philip. People were pissed. <laughs> Matt Stone and Trey Parker said they got death threats. Oh, wow. They got hate mail. Yes. People were like, we're never going to watch. They were pissed. And then they had to wait another week because it was like a holiday. And then they got Cartman's dad. Yes. And so where this is going is <laughs> right before part eight can yeah. air – Brian actually texts me, and he mentions this story to me. Like, I am gung-ho. I'm like, okay, Cooper's going to wake up. We're going to uh-huh. get more story about Dougie's storyline. And Brian's like, i got to tell you about this South Park <laughs> episode. And boy, were you right. They uh, lynched through a, a, a wrench in everything. Yes. And like, this is a very – and so this is such a big episode that we are lucky to have – John Thorne on the show. Like, I can't think of a better person to have on this show and kind of understand part I eight. was relieved. Yeah. I was really I'm like, <laughs> ah, that's good. We got good. the Godfather of Twin Peaks. The Godfather of Twin Peaks and beyond. If anybody can help us with this show, it's, it's him. him. So we're on the phone with John Thorne, the author of The Central Wrapped in Plastic and uh, was a co-editor of the Blue Rose magazine. Yes, that's it. Yeah. How are you, John? I'm uh, doing great. It's good to talk to you guys. Boy, this is a crazy part this week, and there's like oh, yeah. no better person to have on than you, John. I'm so glad you're on the show this week. Yeah, we're very lucky. <laughs> very lucky to have you today. Uh, well, <laughs> well, thank you. I, I don't know uh, if I'm the best person to have on, but I'll do my best. So this is part eight, Got a Light, and it originally aired on June 25th, 2017. It starts off like an, a normal episode. We've got Mr. C and Ray in the car. They, and, yeah, they, they escape Black Hill. Well, they don't escape. They are let go from Black Hill's jail. Yes. And we learn that Ray has information. I mean, what do you guys well, think? They, What's this information that Ray has? Well, so we already know about this, that the principal secretary had information. Yes. And he, he the only person that she would talk to is Ray. That's but it. what is it? Yeah, it's coordinates. Mm. It's coordinates okay. of some sort. Uh, he, Ray says, um, 
I've got the numbers memorized. I feel like it couldn't be coordinates for the Black Lodge because I feel like that would be something they would he would know. Right. So it's something new, something different. Mm, maybe. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And so then Ray is basically blackmailing him, saying, "Well, it's going to cost you now and stuff." Yeah. So, so that, I do love that Ray is not doesn't seem to be afraid of Mister C. I mean, from day one, he seems like he's a smart Alec. I mean, he he doesn't care. He, if, yeah, he got some confidence yeah. uh, this time around. And it, it was interesting because we knew the gun was put in the car by the right. war. Mr. C told him, that, uh, I want, want a gun. He wants a piece in there, right? Yeah. Ray goes to use the bathroom. Yeah. Mr. C comes out with a gun, tries to shoot him. There's blanks. And then Ray turns around with a gun and shoots Mr. C. Yeah. Tricked him. And it seems like he, somehow either Ray was able to swap the guns, or I do think it, the warden was a part of this. Me too. I, I feel like they hoodwinked them. First, I do think the warden planned all that. I mean, Ray had a gun mm. in his pants. Uh, so he had to have it before he left the jail cell. That was all. The warden, you know, set it up, figuring, hey, look, if I let this guy go, I'm in real big trouble. So I've got to. I've got to take him out, and he failed. And so maybe we're going to find out just exactly who Joe McCluskey is and what mm. Mr. Strawberry has to do with everything, <laughs> because it sounded like uh, Mr. C, you know, was pretty certain he was threatening him uh, mm. back in Part Seven. If you, you know, if you mess yep. this up, you're going you're to be in trouble. After Ray talking to Jeffries, is Ray an agent? The Phil Jeffries thing, I think, is still very much open. Uh, it needs more information mm. because there's the possibility that the Philip Jeffries that Mr. C talked to was an imposter or some, mm. some other force. Or, and so if that's the same person Ray is talking to, then it's someone just going by the name Philip Jeffries. All of that, of course, I think we need a lot more information. But whoever it was you know, that Ray was talking to uh, obviously had been trying to set up taking out Bad Cooper, Mr. C, mm. for some time. And True. Ray and, and Daria were the ones who had to do it. We'll see you all. I think. I hope <laughs> we'll find out yeah. more about what they're how they're involved. It, it looks like Ray. We'll see more of Ray. He's yeah. on his way somewhere. Mr. C is shot. Is on the ground, and all of a sudden we get these uh, spirits out of nowhere coming down on the ground, and they're dancing or they're circling around Mr. Uh, Mr. Very Cooper creepy. There. Very yes. well done. I think we know they're the woodsmen. Yeah, we can call them the woodsmen. The woodsmen. It's the same. Would I mean one of these woodsmen we've seen in the jail cell? We just saw last week in the morgue, mm. and now we got to see a whole truckload of them. Yes, doing a ritual. Maybe six of them, possibly. Yeah, yeah. and and it was interesting. This is where things get crazy. I mean, they were rubbing the blood and everything all over his uh, Mr. C's face and their his, bo- and his, his body, chest his chest, and, and, yeah. and you know Ray sees this and he takes off. He sees this. I mean, it, it wasn't like. What really startles him, I mean, is we see Bob. Yeah, he's taking. Yeah, they're taking out the orb, and you see Bob's face on it. Yeah, which is like a seed. They're and, taking and, out the Bob seed. Yeah. So, are, is the understanding is Bob is now out of Mister C? Is that the understanding? It does seem right now, and I just watched the episode a second time before I talked to you guys because I wanted it to be fresh. Mm. It really does seem as if Bob that whole routine and ritual they do I and mean, they're digging at dirt and then they're suddenly the body's sort of there and then they're smearing the blood and then they're sort of birthing this sort of um orb? Yeah, it's an orb but it almost seems fleshy I, yeah. I, I, I don't know it's very very hard to make it out but on my second viewing it did look like they were removing it from a from the middle of mr c's body and so i think just with that little bit of information and then of course he sits up again later it's hard to say but at least at that moment it does seem seem that they removed it. Yeah. Now, uh, the interesting thing in the second viewing here, and I'll be watching this one, I'm sure, uh, two or three more times, <laughs> but Ray is talking on the phone. We, we mentioned that. He's talking on the phone. He's driving away. He says, I saw something in Cooper. Mm. This may be the key to what this is all about. Right. Oh. So that's an interesting line uh, that confirms that Ray did see what we saw, and that was mm. the face of Bob being inside Cooper and obviously being pulled out. Yeah. Right now, without having seen part nine, it's quite possible we've got a Mr. C removed from Bob. So we have just now the evil Cooper without Bob inside him sort of assisting him. Mm. So I would, if that's the case, then I would also speculate 
that this is a weakened Mr. C. Hmm. Yeah. So we will we we will see. Yeah. It's such new territory. I was trying to compare it to like Leland's death. Like so, Leland dies and he he returns to himself and that but Bob escapes in this situation. Bob isn't like forcefully taken out. He's forcefully taken out. So it's kind of yeah. is it like an exorcist or something? Like is there like some kind of chant that they're doing? They're and then, removing the bad seed. Phys- maybe <laughs> or, <laughs> at the same time, are they heal? They could be healing. Uh, Mr. C as well. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to figure out what it all is. If Mr. C was hurt and Bob could no longer be there, why couldn't he just get away and turn into an owl or something? I think the Leland situation is far different from mm. what we have here. We have essentially a, a different entity. It's not really a fully a human entity in Mr. C. He's half of Cooper, mm. and he was divided. They, you know, Cooper. My theory, of course, is that Cooper divided into two. I think that's fairly, mm. you know, obvious now. And uh, uh, you know, half the half of him came out, uh, and he was in alliance with Bob, as opposed to Bob using Leland like a puppet. Mm-hmm. And I mean, when Leland when Leland dies, I get the sense that Bob is discarding Leland. That mm. Bob has the ability himself to move on. Uh, mm. We see an owl later on in a in a shot, you know, flying through the woods. And right. that, that Bob can kind of perhaps. You know, have a little more control over uh, what he does with that body he's possessing. Whereas, and and the rules are vague, and nothing's been defined, and maybe Lynch and Frost themselves aren't fully, you know, committing to anything. But but there's an alliance more than there is a possession here, and that maybe in some way Bob was somewhat trapped within. Um, Mr. C, that he mm. couldn't really have the same freedom that he had when he was possessing mm. Leland. And so in, in a way, you know, I, if you think back into what little clues we have in the earlier part of this story so far, mm. uh, you know, we have Mr. C on the phone with the imposter Philip Jeffries, and he says, you know, you're going back in and I will be with Bob again. Mm. And yeah. now in retrospect, it's almost like we're going to get Bob back we, we, we're trying to free bob you are possessing bob in a mm. way yeah. instead of the other way around I, again i i don't know but this episode at least seems to imply that bob was less powerful and certainly not in possession of Mr. Right. C. Another good example is the jail, and Mr. C looks in the mirror and says, "Oh, good, you're still with me." So it's, it's that's what I was going to bring up yeah. too, right? Because, yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah. oh, Mr. C's been doing his own thing all along. It's not like Bob is possessing him. He's he's doing his own thing. And- I go back to that scene all the time. Why would he be asking himself, "Are you with me?" Right. You know. And Bob's like, "Yes," mm-hmm. and he's like, "Good." So they're working in tandem. Right. They're yeah, working yeah. together. Right. That scene at first, when I first saw it, I was like, "Are they just trying to tell the audience this?" Mm-hmm. But I don't. Th- right now, you know, now yeah, looking yeah. back, I, I see why they did it. At first, I was just like, "Is this just storytelling?" Right, to right. say, I thought the same thing. Yeah, yeah. is this the, for the new people? You right. know, why are they doing this? Yeah, we yeah, know yeah. Bob is there. I just want to throw this out there. I already know I'm wrong, but I want to throw throw this up. Any chance <laughs> Mr. C could actually be the real Cooper? Is it possible that he gets shot and now Mr. C is dead and and Dougie is no longer there, and all of a sudden we have the good Cooper. That's my theory. That's my theory. Oh, yeah? It's a great idea. What if, uh, you know, both Dougie and Mr. C now sort of are just two Coopers? Mm. You know, they they need to reunite because they aren't really— That's interesting, too. Um, yeah. You know, not a real full body, but they but maybe Mr. C isn't as evil. I, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if you go back to the mythology, which is vague from the first series, obviously— Hawk is saying there's a shadow self, there's an evil side, mm. yeah. you know. So so it does seem as if there's a good and there's a bad. And, and yeah. I don't quite know how this would be the good or fully realized Cooper yet, unless right. they give us yeah. more information. Yeah, I, so you know. the reason I would say no, because his eyes are still black, so I want to believe that... Oh, they were? Yeah, I didn't notice still that. Black. Okay. I'm just throwing it out there. And I think story-wise... I think it's more interesting to have Mr. C still be evil and he still has his own plan. And yeah. I think story-wise it makes more sense. But I was just thinking, boy, he got shot. Is it possible that we now have I, something different? I don't know if John knows my, my theory, but I'm still – I'm. I guess can't get away that Dougie – I feel like Dougie's part of the subconscious of Mr. C that he made to stop. He put roadblocks up for Cooper forever coming back, and this was a roadblock. For the way I perceive it so far, and I'm sure it's going to be wrong, um, but I I kind of perceive 
the whole Dougie world just made up by Mr. C to trap him like another world that he's just in there and and everybody's coddling him everybody acts it's it feels different it's filmed different everything is too lotty dotty mm. and he and <laughs> and the um the red room i mean it's two birds one stone and i think of Dougie's the stone the two birds are bob gets back you get to go home and home and you bring up the wizard of oz stuff ben mm-hmm. and then i think about that well home Wizard of Oz, that was a dream. Uh, Dorothy was... It, was it? it, was it? Was, yeah. <laughs> Dorothy was like in a coma, and that nothing really happened. And I kind of feel like uh, Cooper is in this strange world right now where he, he's kind of just floating. And if he was shot, what if that just disappeared and we never saw Dougie again? And just Cooper was back. I don't think it's going to happen. I think I think Cooper and Dougie are going to have to meet. Yeah. But... um. I don't know. That, it's interesting. That's where I'm we'll, going with we'll that. We've got two weeks to find out. I know. I know. So the next thing that happens <laughs> is the, uh, we are at the Roadhouse. Yeah, my favorite part of the I show. Knew you'd love I really, I, I, yes. I, I love very it. excited. I thought it was very Ed Sullivan. The Beatles. It's, yeah, it's the, the Nine, Nine Inch Nails. <laughs> it was really cool to see Nine Inch Nails perform on television. I've seen them live multiple times, but seeing them on TV was cool. Interesting. They picked this song. The song just came out last year, so I kind of feel. Because Trent Reznor and David Lynch have a relationship. Yep, they they worked on Lost Highway. They uh, did, soundtrack. And, and David Lynch directed like two of his music videos. The song's called "She's Gone Away." It's from an EP that just came out last year called "Not the Actual Events." It's just like weird little things, and uh, yeah, the the lyrics. I I was looking at the lyrics. I mean, if you read into them, they kind of feel like they could fit into the Twin Peaks mythology. Uh, like the first part of the lyrics, you dig in a place till your fingers bleed. Spread the infection where you spill your seed. I can't remember what she came uh, here for. I can't remember much of anything anymore. A little mouth open, opened up inside. And it kind of like, it, it kind of brought back imagery of Leland, Firewalk with me, with Leland and Laura trying to spread the infection onto his daughter. And his daughter escaping that. And, I mean, he raped her. I mean, she potentially could have had a kid. Yeah. Um, It's funny. I mean, I don't want to get too far ahead, but at the very end of the episode, we have a whole mouth thing and somebody... Yes, yeah, definitely. It goes right right into that. The second part is, yeah, I was watching the day she died. We keep looking while the skin turns black. Cut along the length, but you can't get the feeling back. She's gone, she's gone, she's gone away. And then at the end, he asks, are you still there? Are you still here? Which is interesting. That brings me back with, yeah. with, with the Bob scene. That brings me back to the Bob scene. So it's interesting lyrics. It's an interesting song. I, I think they picked the right song to be there. It kind of fit, you know? And I had a flashback to James singing. because oh, it, no. It, no, no, no. <laughs> wow. Just you and me? Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. you and Just me? Just you and me. <laughs> No, no, this is why storytelling, not not the not not the emotions that song evoked, but because David Lynch brought us concert. Here, enjoy this. Yeah, yeah, I can see he, that. He lured it's us a, into some yeah. comfort zone because we, he's trained us these last past seven Your weeks. Your version of a comfort zone is my comfort zone. <laughs> but a concert to me, when I saw tw- these Twin Peaks episodes, is oh, the show is coming to an end. Every time the show would come to an end, we'd see the roadhouse. Intermission. Yeah. So he's kind of like, here's a, um, we're giving you a quick break because the next thing you're going to see is going to be hard to really understand. Oh. Yeah, I, and I take that because we, we saw James sing and then Bob attacked us. It was kind of like that same play on <laughs> the way he did things. It reminded me of that anyway. Yeah. Real quick comment on the Nine Inch Nails section. Uh, of course, first viewing, it sort of kind of, a long piece to put in right there. I think, though, that it was deliberate. I think it has meaning. I think that song, the lyrics are obviously cryptic, but, you know, meaningful, and you can assign all kinds of different meanings to them and Mm, how they relate to the story. But the song itself, I think, might function as this transitional um, phase between one part of the story and another. Obviously, within yeah. the episode, it does. Mm, yeah. One part of the story and then a much different one. But I'm I'm thinking maybe on a grander scale that something very, very, very significant happened uh, when Bob was removed from Mr. C. Mm. It is, it is um, 
it is depicted through music in a way that there's a transition happening, that the world that we come back to, and we do come back to Mr. C, um, is now a different world. And I think the rest of the episode may hint at it being a different world. And it may be different in just simply the way that now the forces are realigned, or it may be different in a more significant way. We can talk more about that later. But I think that song actually has a purpose in the narrative, the way it's structured. So I think Hmm. it's more than just, hey, I'm going, I like the, you know, I like Nine Inch Nails or the, which by the way, in the credits, they are there with a quotation around the. Yes, yeah, Um, yeah. You know, I think it's more than just Lynch saying, oh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to indulge myself Mm. and put this long song in there. I think it had, in an 18 hour narrative, I think it had a purpose place there i i totally agree so after uh, mr c sits up we then go to the desert july 16 1945 the white sands new mexico 529 a.m oh before we get the the 529 i don't know if you guys picked up on this or if we can decipher this it says 529 a.m m w t mountain time the interesting thing is it's 529 a.m it's one minute before 5 30 in Twin Peaks, would that make it four thirty? Four three zero. That's a that's a that's a great observation. That is uh, that is really I didn't think about that at all. Um, it would be four thirty in Twin Peaks. Wow. Twin Peaks would be yeah. in the Pacific time zone, and uh, that is the exact time. They, they really, were yeah. you know they got their facts right. That is the exact time that, that the Trinity explosion happened. I don't think we've ever really gone back in time per se in Twin yeah, Peaks. Yeah, nothing like this nothing on like TV. This. Yeah, we've got the secret history of yep. Twin Peaks to do that, but. Briefly, you know, we had this whole Manhattan project that was done. I think it originally started in New York, where um, they were developing the, the world's first atomic bomb. Somebody, uh, a guy named Pavement Oyster, says, um, "Pavement Oyster." He's on Twitter. He says, "Where else would you put a glass box? After all, it's the Manhattan project." So he may, he's, he's connecting the glass oh. box from New York. Yeah. Manha- I, don't, I thought that was a. Kind Is of Mr. C looking for the glass box? Maybe I that's a, I never thought of that. He could be looking. Maybe. For, he, he could be looking for the glass box. One other piece of very cryptic dialogue from part two uh, when he's talking to the imposter, Phil Jeffries. Uh, Phil Jeffries says, "I missed you in New York." Oh, uh, and I so heard that. you know, yeah. they, they could. Back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back. You got to go back and watch that whole hotel room scene like six times in order to pull all the plot out of it. it does say, "I missed you in New York." So the, Im- the implication is that Mr. C was supposed to be in New York for some reason. And anyway, we'll just leave it at that. Yeah, mm, interesting. Uh, John, you recently post up on Twitter. I think isn't it? It's Robert J. What is it? Oppenheimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oppenheimer was yeah. one of the. You know, he was one of the people who was, uh, and maybe the person. He was overseeing the Manhattan Project. He named Atomic Test the Trinity in homage to John Donne's poem, Batter My Heart, Three Persons God, is how he named this project. And we just had, at the beginning of this show, we, we uh, Counter Esperado team, they got Carl Sr. to read that poem. So I thought that was kind of something special. Thank yeah. you, Jubal and the Counter Esperado team for doing that. Yes. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, very much. I think it's valuable to just look at the, the, the images were presented and hmm. the order they're presented in this sequence. So, yeah. uh, and I may get them wrong. You guys can correct me. Um, obviously, we have the atomic explosion. The camera goes right into the mushroom cloud. We get a lot of abstract visuals hmm. of fire and strange um, dots and white dots and, and imagery, which I think in, in many respects, having watched it again and having gone back and done a little research on the music that was used in this sequence, which is the serenity for the victims of Hiroshima, um, it almost seems as if Lynch is trying to provide just a visual to the music. So when the music changes into some odd, strange sound, uh, he, he, I think Lynch is like, well, this is what I visualize when I hear that. Mm. So then the music changes and we get a new image. So I think in some ways he's responding to the music in this sequence um, and just giving it some mm. sort of visual poetry. Uh, but we go through all the way through that explosion, and then I think we go from there to the convenience store. We, we go through the explosion and all the bizarre abstract imagery, and then we, we come out at the outside of the convenience store in black and white, which itself the convenience store begins to flicker and smoke 
begins to billow from it, um, in, you know, in, in mm. a weird time jumping kind of fashion. And then the woodsmen all appear uh, outside of it. Mm. Of course, it's multiple versions of those groups sort of uh, busily wandering around outside, almost as if a ant nest has been disturbed. And yeah. then they're, they're they, I think they, I think they finally slowly sort of find their way inside it. I do believe we get imagery yes. of them inside uh, through the window and they're, and they're not outside anymore. So they're inside the convenience store. It's the same editing style no. as uh, the woman with no eyes. It's that same stuttering. Uh, it is with that, with, with the convenience particularly store. Particularly with that smoke coming out. Yeah. yeah the smoke comes out and then it's in, then it's out further, then it's in and out, in and out, and then it's gone, and then it's out again. Yeah. So we are seeing It's like that backwards, almost, forwards kind of. Yeah. Yeah. So we mentioned the convenience store. Should we. Should we take that convenience store to be the same idea of above the convenience store they have meetings? I, I or, thought the same thing. I know, but my reaching is it just, it's so just hard a, not to think that way. But no, no, no. I, I, I think I mean Lynch labels it the convenience store. The convenience store was obviously mentioned as far back as the European pilot hmm. uh, when they originally shot you know that footage uh, that ended up as the dream, and then of course the convenience store is referenced again in Firewalk with Me when Philip Jeffrey says I've been to one of their meetings. So yes, I, I think this convenience store whether it's the an actual physical place that they ended up on earth or whether it is some sort of abstract place between worlds i don't mm, know uh, yeah. but i think i think lynch labeled it for us to all say okay well this is where the woodsmen uh, if they don't meet there regularly they reside there mm. and um i mean the concept of above the convenience store doesn't have to be a three-dimensional concept they meet above the convenience above could mean anything it could be on right. a plane above that it could yeah. be you know like that box that floats in space that cooper went through that it just you know there isn't any three-dimensional navigation that we could go around that is deliberately we're supposed to recognize aha the convenience store has been introduced into the story and so, Brian, you're talking about we all think is the same creature that was in the glass box, yeah. which the American girl from the Purple uh, World uh, t mentions the mother. Yeah, I mean, I and think Sam all... and Tracy get killed by the mother. I got to interrupt you. How do you know that it's it's the mother inside the glass box? It, we're, we're, How um, do we know that it? For me, from what I saw, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But um, I'm okay. My theory. Okay, so it's not been somewhere. It's not somewhere been defined in a I, know, they the captioning or something. They haven't defined it in the show, but uh, okay. I remember okay. the first episode seeing the figure that had breasts. It was a topless woman yep. with mm -hmm. a with a hole in mm -hmm. its face. And maybe if I go back, maybe if you lighten up the image, you can see the little ears. I don't know. Uh, then you have Mr. C holding the card with that figure's yeah. face. It could, right. It which, has horns. It has I mean, horns. I actually, the first time I've seen the horns is in this episode. Yeah. I didn't see the horns before. And, and then now we get to see it spitting out. But John, you're right. I think we're, 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 we're that, that pounding, we're that pounding the door. Uh, part three, yeah. and woman says mother, but you're right. It doesn't have to be that. I guess I was thinking there's a creature sound. There's some kind of being out yeah, there. Yeah, she says, hurry, I, mother's coming. I connected it. It doesn't have to be. It could be a whole nother. It could it be could. a woodsman. I don't know. It could be any. But, it can't be a woodsman because it's mother. Yeah, the mother <laughs> gives birth because I feel like Bob is out, but mother wants him back. And I think mother is more powerful than Bob. What's more powerful than you is your mom. Ah. So now, now Bob's got a snap. Bob is out in the world. We don't know what he's doing. And mother has escaped, and nobody really knows about. Mr. C seems to know about Bob. So that's mom. where we're leaning towards. But you're right, John. Yeah. I, I There's no that, concrete evidence right. other than our theory. <laughs> what do you make, John, of this creature? And it, I, I don't know if they're uh, uh, puking out or Gorbando beans. <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, this is all still, you know, we, we, we don't know. Uh, I, I must say the first time I saw that figure floating in space, I did think of the figure we saw in the glass box, but I think there are some differences, uh, you know, the one in the glass box seemed to be decayed or damaged in some way. It could very well be the same figure. Mm -hmm. And certainly that's the first connection w we make, but I, I, I hold off from, from committing to, to, to that. I don't really know what this figure is. Obviously, it does um, sort of puke or spit out this viscous uh, stuff. Uh, and what is that? We don't know. I mean, again, we can, we can 
go ahead and start coming up with all kinds of ideas. Yeah. But it, I think it's pretty evident that it, that it contains within it, uh, sort of suspended uh, in, within this 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 gel or fluid or whatever, a lot of eggs, um, mm. uh, quite a few eggs, uh, and uh, and then sort of tucked in uh, to this stream of stuff is a black uh, image uh, of Bob, which mm. almost looks very much as if he doesn't belong, as if he has cancerous growth on whatever this is, or that he's a stowaway on whatever this is. Mm. Or, and I do have a theory here, but I rarely read um, reviews of the parts as they come out, because uh, I'm writing about it, and I'm trying to stay as clean as I can. Yeah. Uh, but this one I did read. I, re- I read a lot. I read The Esquire and The Vanity Fair and The Entertainment Weekly and, and a lot of you know, the things that have been online and almost every one of them, I think in, in fact, in every one of them, they call it, this is the origin story of Bob and this mm. is how Bob came into the world, that there was a rift in realities and because of the nuclear explosion. And so Bob came into the world and that may be true. And, in, in, and I will tell you right now, I, I hope that's true in some mm. way, because I like that idea. I just don't think it is. I, I think, I think Lynch is doing a flashback in some respect here time is so slippery in Twin Peaks, um, if you look at it strictly in terms of a linear set of images, this Bob is removed from Mr. C, and the next time we see him, his face within this bulbous mass, is in that stream of puke or whatever it is. Yeah. So uh, I, and we don't really can't say for sure that it's 19... 19- 45. Obviously, the implication is, and Mm -hmm. we're set up to believe that, and it it, it probably is. But um, the Bob is in in there, and I just seem to think that this is where Bob showed up next. Uh, I Mm. think in terms of his narrative or his story, you know, uh, they take him, and then this is where he, he comes out next. Uh, so, so that this is not necessarily a flashback to how Bob entered the world or began. This is how Bob is getting back into the world from having pulled out of Mr. C. Hmm. Uh, and if that is the case, and again, I will tell you right now, I hope it's not actually, because I think it makes it very, very hard. It will be very, very difficult to, to analyze this show. But that, of course, that's what Twin Peaks is, and we love it for that. Hmm. Yeah. But I just can't shake the idea that Lynch deliberately showed us this this face of Bob being pulled out of Mr. C, and then the next time we see it being puked out of this this thing, and I think he wants to think that this is where Bob ended up after that. Hmm. And so uh, the implications for this, it's way too early to tell. It could very well be that Bob is finding a way back in to the world in an earlier time and can now potentially alter the timeline. And so that Things may mm. end up changing. I've got the weight of Mark Frost's book on my mind. <laughs> it is it is weighing me down. I, I I cannot be free of the shackles of that book. And, I, and I'm not trying to make anything negative. I, I love that book. Um, but that book obviously posits something very different in terms of the timeline that we know. Mm. So I have that on my mind, and I can't help but think, how do we get there? Maybe it's a forgery, uh, uh, but maybe not. Maybe, in fact, uh, something significant happened in the past to change the timeline, and maybe this is it. Uh, way, way too early to tell. And for everyone listening, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think this may be Bob coming back into the world. Took it as like, mm-hmm. oh, we're seeing mm-hmm. the beginning. I mean, I love this episode. I, I, it was beautiful, and I was immersed. The only thing that took me out of it uh, was seeing... Frank Silva's face on that orb because I I kind of felt like it was holding our hand by telling us this is Bob. I, I kind of feel like this is like the evil entering the world or, you know, like, I don't know. Does it have to be Bob? It could just be but, the evil, you know? But the problem, the problem with that is, I mean, obviously there was evil in the world long before 1945. Yeah. I mean, atomic bomb, can, be as... can you be more evil than atomic yeah, bomb? Yeah, I mean, just... <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, yeah, certainly how you use an atomic bomb. The serenity for the victims of Hiroshima, I think, is deliberate. Yeah. Again, back to Mark Frost's book, uh, which, again, is not necessarily canon. So I don't want to rely too heavily on mm. it. But I, it's an important work, and it does posit that 
you know, these evil forces were in around Twin Peaks area as far back as Lewis and Clark and probably yeah, much yeah. further back. I mean, uh, Lewis gets the Owl Cave Ring. Um, there's some implication that there's a strange looking being, you know, around this, uh, I guess it's a cave that they go to in the book. Um, that may be one of the woodsmen, that may be Bob, yeah. uh, that may be something else entirely. Uh, but I, the 1945 thing, and I know there's a quote in the original Twin Peaks where the one our man says Bob's been around for nearly 40 years, which would you know perfectly match mm. this time frame. But maybe this is where Bob came into the world. It's yeah. quite that, possible. That's what really I'm going with right now. Obviously, the Black Lodge forces, I, they had to have existed before 1945. I would, so I would it, say given what we've right. seen in Twin Peaks. but. Maybe not, and Frost and Lynch may be saying, "No, this is how we're going to define it now. This is the beginning. This is the you know the still point, uh, you mm. know, where the the bomb went off. It started everything for centuries. These things existed, these entities, these uh, spirits, and this was the moment where they were able to get to our world. That the atomic bomb let them in and let Bob in. But I mean, I would say Bob has been around so, for centuries, but the, yeah. it was just that the origin of him being able to come to our world." So what Leland says in the original series, um, I remember that man. He was at my grandfather's mm. cabin when I was a little boy. Yeah. Now, I guess, you know, you know, how old was Leland in 1989? Right. Um, Could have been. He, so he, he Probably you 40s, know, I guess. Right? Maybe forties. Yeah, so he could, it could work. The timing could work. I mean, it's very possible. And yeah. I, again, I like it. Um, I just think that there's some things that it still doesn't quite resolve. But but I, I also think the next sequence that we're about to talk about is very very important to this overall idea of, of um, whether or not this is the beginning of Bob or if this is just a cycle and mm. the return of Bob. And th and that sequence is uh, the. The giant, I uh, put it in quotes because he's not identified as that. Yeah, I call him in, not the giant. Uh, yeah, in, the giant and his in, wife. In whatever, we, in, in the tower room, uh, you know, on the island. Do you guys consider that the White Lodge? Because I was like, are we seeing the White Lodge for the first time? I'm thinking maybe. I was, and I feel like these are the godlike people who kind of watch over. And it's interesting, they don't talk just like Dougie. You know, they're, they're, they walk slowly, <laughs> they, they move in a very slow pace, they're, they no expression, kind of remind me of Dougie a little bit, uh, and Dougie what is a gold, well, he was a gold sphere, well, they turned his body into a gold sphere, and they send a gold sphere into mm -hmm. the world with Laura Palmer's picture on it, um, so that was interesting little uh, connection there. Um, but I think it's the white. I mean, do, John, what do you think? Is it the White Lodge we're we're seeing? Well, I lean toward it being the White Lodge. Uh, but um, you know, I just watched it a second time, and there are some interesting things going on in there. I do believe that they are communicating with one another. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think it's it's pretty well. It's just clear, but it, there seems to be a distinct moment where, and let's just say on the surface, it, it's a pretty simplistic uh, set of events. Uh, an alarm goes off. They are look and they see, oh, look, there's Bob. We got to do something about it. Mm. Here's what we do. So in just simple, simple terms, yeah. it seems like they're responding to the alarm and they're, and they're going to try to counter whatever has happened. So that all aside, the, the, I'm going to call him the giant. And I do that because I know everyone knows who I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah he's the giant. Listed as question marks. So the giant comes out. The alarm goes off. The giant comes out from behind the bell-shaped metal, and he stares, he turns and he looks at the woman, and he stares at her for a while. And I believe they are communicating in yeah. that moment. Yeah, yeah. Then he comes out and he stares forward, and he actually basically stares straight at us into the camera for a little while. And then he turns the alarm off, and then he goes back and he looks at her again for for quite a few moments. They just stare at one another, and again, I believe they're communicating. Yeah. And you could, you, who knows what they're saying, but he might be saying. I got to go in the other room and create the orb. And she's like, yeah, you do. Uh, I'm going to follow you. <laughs> so, uh, and then he, he leaves, he walks through, he goes in, he, he, he plays the images we've seen of the explosion yeah. of the, the woodsman in front of the convenience store. And then he freezes it on Bob. Uh, and it's almost as if he's like, okay, yeah, I know exactly what I need to do. It's almost, it's not like he's alarmed 
like, "Uh (laughs) uh-oh, what are we going to do? It's very much like, okay, now I got to know exactly what I need to do. I float up in space and I, you know, weave this, this golden orb. And then, of course, the woman comes in and she watches it in great wonder and almost delight as Mm. she watches it. She's, she's um, captivated and she seems to be in some sort of glorious state as she watches this orb be created and then she embraces it and she gives it a, a, a very tender and loving kiss hmm. and so i again i'm just we don't know but it almost seems as if this is a a husband and a wife yeah that's who I got are it. participating in the creation of something uh something maybe life maybe just a force of good maybe something else entirely that we can't put words a to spirit? but yeah. but they, they both they both seem to be involved. I mean, obviously, the giant more involved it seems than she is, but she does give it that that kiss, mm-hmm. and and then she puts it forth into the tube, which puts it on, I guess, deposits it onto the planet Earth. Mm. Um, I, I just want to comment on the the image of Laura Palmer in in the orb. Yeah. Um, obviously it's the Laura Palmer image we've seen in the homecoming picture. It's oh, a yeah. famous, famous picture. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so obviously it's a signal to the audience. This is Laura Palmer, but why that image? I mean, obviously as a signal, it's essential, right. yeah. but did they create Laura Palmer at that age? Is Laura Palmer at that age somehow mm. more significant than Laura Palmer at any other age? Why not the Laura Palmer we've seen earlier in part, Two, where she appears to Cooper. I mean, right. why D- that? And D- so, again, I wonder if this is a cycle where Bob has returned, and now Laura Palmer has to return. Hmm. And so this is the Laura Palmer they are putting back into the world, connecting it to Laura Palmer being torn away from Cooper in part two. Yes. Mm-hmm. Where yes. she is standing there, she whispers to him, he reacts with some alarm, and then she... It seems against her will, but she gets pulled away. Yes, yeah, she's and I wonder out. if if and that's if the this giant, is the giant. Yes, yeah, doing well, that, saying, you know, we need you again. Right. We need you, and, and I guess I agree, John. The only reason I want to, uh, yeah, I'm a little confident, confident in this is that I think David Lynch feels that the presence of Laura Palmer is vital to this story. That he has not done with that character, mm. and that she has a very, very significant role. Still to play. I think you're right. The original timeline of Laura Palmer was kind of like the evil was basically trying to manipulate her and control her mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. possess her. And now we have this opportunity for maybe the good spirits to use her to fight the evil Bob. That's what I'm thinking. Yeah, maybe they're kind of yeah. like conjuring up to save Cooper. Maybe it's almost the world. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's almost as if now, and again, we don't have enough data to support this at all. But it's almost as if you know, Laura survived the ordeal in Firewalk with me, and she was at a, mo- a place of peace and some power at the end of Firewalk with mm, me. I would, yeah. I would suggest that she had achieved what she needed to do. She had transcended, and I wonder if that. Laura Palmer, who's been through all of this, mm. is the Laura Palmer they're sending back. The yeah. Laura Palmer who is much stronger than she was in her earlier life. Well, is- in the original series, in the Red Room, the little man says, this isn't Laura Palmer. This is She looks yeah. like her, mm-hmm. right. and she's filled with secrets. Mm-hmm. So that person we mm-hmm. saw, was that the sort of like, you know, we have... We have Cooper and a Dougie. No, nah, but I think it's I think it's Laura Palmer. I mean, well, and then well, the beginning I mean, of this series, yeah, yeah. she does the same thing. Too says, um, "I feel like I know her," and then all of a sudden it, she goes back to, "I am yeah, Laura Palmer." Yeah, they are sending Laura Palmer. When are they sending her? Who says? Just because we see her go back into the Earth, does that mean it's 1945? Do we it, reboot? Is was that a hard reboot of Twin Peaks? <laughs> that a Lynchian hard boot? Like was that like, and we're putting the brakes here because Mr. C was killed? I hope not. I hope and we're going to go right back. I, I think there's still plenty to tell in this timeline, but I know, yeah. I know the book, and I know there's a lot of there's a lot of hints that we could be rebooting. But I hope we continue. Go forward. Yeah. Go forward. I mean, yeah. And there's two things, John. I want to bring up because you just talked about it. Yeah. Um, the the bell. We saw that bell with the with um. Back oh, in, sure. There's three. a couple of them. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So that that bell is a an alarm for in, in multiple outer space things. With a uh, with a uh, floating head, Major Briggs. There, it seemed like there was that bell yeah. that banging on. Yeah. In the woman, um, in w- with uh, Cooper, um, there was a bell there. And then with when the giant was there, and I perceived as his wife walking up, 
it looked you had to get on like a stage, which is love mm. affair with the stage. Oh yeah. And I oh, thought absolutely yeah. Yeah, I thought she was gonna sing. I would have loved it if she sang. <laughs> I really thought we were gonna get an eraser head um sort of mm-hmm. vibe where she was gonna have a we might still yeah, yeah right and i i was all for it i was like yes please sing and she didn't but um i i would have liked it i don't uh, know why a, a quick note that stage those stairs you walked up and uh, i know the stage and the balcony there that is the uh same actual physical location that Lynch shot the hall and drive uh when, i think it was tower you know, theater um, i think well and you know, again we talked about this in earlier podcasts we were discussing um uh i think we were just discussing elephant man uh there's a stage at the end of elephant man i mean lynch loves stages he yeah. loves to have a stage it, it's an important space for him and it's not uh surprising that there was a stage as part of this world yeah yes. it was great yeah. to see you like i was like and very yeah. cool. Very, very cool. cool. Now, so Brian, you brought up you brought up Dougie as an orb. You know, when he gets back, when yeah, the real he, Dougie, manufactured Dougie, goes to the red room, he becomes this golden circle yeah. marble thing. Could this be the whole idea of the manufacturing thing? It comes that maybe it comes out of your head, out of these spirits' heads. <laughs> and they... was was this Laura manufactured? Was ma- this Laura was manufactured by them that they're sending down? Maybe you know what I'm saying. Like I mean, I, I like to believe they... I like to believe the spirit is real. Uh-huh. I like to believe that that is the really is Laura Palmer's spirit. But maybe they are actually recreating her again to be out in the real world. But the idea that it's just to me it's coincidence that it's a golden circle and yep. we have a manufacturing Dougie that was a golden circle. Yeah, yeah, it's very interesting these golden circles you know it was so funny when before season three started i was all worried i'm like what are they gonna do with the ring and now it's just all about the orbs <laughs> <laughs> like the yeah. ring I, you yeah. know we really yeah. haven't seen much of the ring i mean just to get into a little bit of secret history of twin peaks there was a lot of stuff where like ufos and and it's like oh is this the x-file the book i mean there was stuff where, like what does this have anything to do with twin peaks uh-huh. and then in, diving into this episode and researching and looking back into the book there's definitely things that are that seem to refer to this episode the whole white sands where the atomic bomb took place dougie milford actually worked there during the time of the atomic bomb jack parson and uh, hubbard both worked around they were in that area they were doing rituals. This whole ritual idea came from from this whole book called The Moo- Moon Child, which the idea of this book, and this is an actual real book uh-huh. by uh, Crowley, and it was the idea of the book. Alistair Crowley. Yeah, I sh- so there's a whole battle be- between uh-huh. two lodges, the black and the white, oh. and there's magicians fighting over an unborn child who may or may not be the Antichrist. So if Frost was inspired by this book for Twin Peaks, but it's also interesting that so these characters – especially Jack Parson, is doing these rituals in the desert. It seems to open up a gate, and it seems like he wants to get, maybe get this unborn child to be part of this world. As soon as the, we see the atomic explosion, I immediately thought of Frostbook. I mean, mm. I'm just like, wow, okay, I didn't expect that. I mean, really didn't expect that to go back. You immediately think, well, Frost was well aware that they were going to depict the, the, you know, the, the Trinity explosion, and so you know, he incorporated that um, historical event and all of those characters and, and, and you know, he wove all of that mystery around that into the book. I mean, I think Frost is very aware of the works of Aleister Crowley and Theosophy and Dion Fortune and all of those, um, you know, occultish books and the ideas of good versus evil and on this world and another world. And whether or not he's trying to literally connect them to Twin Peaks or whether or not there's just simply the inspiration for how they are portraying some mm. of these same kinds of forces in Twin Peaks. Uh, you know, I think he, he sees a, an echo or a resemblance there and he's happy to uh, point them out and mm. weave them into his story so that it just gets us thinking and talking. But uh, how much of it he's deliberately trying to define, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in the book, again, Jack Parson says, the desert is a perfect medium for summing an empty canvas, a beaker into which under certain circumstances and fearless rigor, you can create an elixir that will call forth, call them what you will, messages of gods. But it seems to me that they they had this idea of, of doing a ritual and so my interpretation of this, could the atomic bo- bomb be that opening ritual that opens up the gate to allow the spirits 
into the world. That's my interpretation. I'm looking at Mark Frost's work, and I'm looking at what yeah. I'm seeing in, yeah. the, in the show. I and agree I'm thinking, with that. Is it possible this is the ritual that by 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 such <laughs> force, such explosion, we're able to break open the worlds to do this, let them in? So that's my two cents. Should we go into the egg? The we, egg. we should go not only go into the egg, but we <laughs> should go in not past 1945 and move to 1956. Yes, that's the time period. You're right. I think the egg came out in 1945. I think Lynch kind of tries to convey that this is the same place. It's the, it's mm. the sands. It's the desert. Right. Uh, and that and he starts us in the the, the frame in the picture in 1945. So we are back in 1945 when we start. Uh, and then very quickly, the time clicks forward to 1956. So I think he's saying, in this spot, 11 years transpired, and the egg was there for 11 years, and it was that incubation time, mm. and then it hatched. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I'm not sure it means anything or if it's you know of any importance, but I, I do think the egg had been sitting there for for over a decade and then it hatched right the egg isn't bob right i mean like we, we should interpret that that uh, that roach fly frog thing of you know is not bob. i've heard two things people are very it's very interesting are i seem to be talking about this is this is this bob laying itself into somebody or is this laura is this is no, this the even, good is this laura. the good or the bad like what would this res- what does this represent? I guess I not well, represent I, a person, I, but it, it is really early to tell. Um, but and very closely at the episode, um, I, I would say I don't think it's Laura. Uh, no, I think Lynch would never represent Laura Palmer. I mean, he represents Laura Palmer as this angelic presence mm, in, yeah. a, in, a, in a glow light. He's not going to represent her as some bug fit. He's, you know, he's gonna. It's a gross, disgusting thing with frog legs and yes. wings. That's not Laura Palmer to Lynch. And I, I, I mean, it could be, and I could be totally wrong, uh, and I'm happy to be, but I just doesn't doesn't fit with yeah, Lynch's yeah. approach. No, I agree. Um, I think it's an evil it's presence. Not, well, yeah, and watching it a second time, um, you know, the uh, we see the image early on of the, the vomit stuff coming out, and the the camera kind of zooms along the edge of it, and we see Bob. Yes, and then we see the egg sort of break free and mm-hmm. float away. Well, yeah. And again, it's not absolutely clear, but I my impression is that's the egg. And I wonder now, after having watched it a second time, whether Bob was able to attach himself to that egg. Ah, and, that's uh, and 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 that was how Bob found his way back onto Earth. Now, again, there's just no evidence yet to support that, other than the fact that Bob is in that that viscous material right there with that egg. Yeah. So there is somewhat of a connection between those two things. And if that egg maybe was supposed to be something else entirely and Bob perverted it, Hmm. um, of course this would then introduce a whole new way of uh, interpreting what Bob is. If, If Bob now takes on this sort of ugly form of a creature and he enters into people, you know, physically, I, it's all completely new. We've never seen or it's never been implied mm. that anything like that had ever happened. So I'm not sure I want to commit to that being the case. But there is the subtlest of connections that Bob was there when that egg broke free. Mm. And so maybe this Bob sort of took a ride yeah. uh, onto whatever this, this and I thing will just, was. Yeah. And but, I would say there's more than one egg. Anyway. I think we saw multiple eggs in that vomit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I would, it, de- it definitely is plausible he could catch. I mean, he could attach himself to one egg. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we're now in this whole sequence of this town, and and things are going to start happening with with the woodsmen. I feel like this whole sequence feels almost like 1950s B movies or something. Like I don't know, like, it's like a. <laughs> I don't know, yeah, it's like it was feel, creepy. It's creepy, but it's like we have like these creatures who are like slowly going after people, and it's like I mean, somehow, Got a light. somehow yeah. Lynch makes it work, but it. it in another context, you would think, "Boy, this is really cheesy," but it, it's not. But it's like <laughs> it's scary. It's creepy. Yeah, but how yeah. does he do it? Where it's kind of like, if I was looking at something else, I would think I'm watching some old movie where creatures are going after people. And mm. I don't know. I mean, yeah, it, it works. It, but it works. Yeah, there's something very interesting that happens here, and uh, so I just have to give you a little background as we go through it. After we see the egg hatch, 
uh, and the thing kind of crawl off screen. As I believe at that point, uh, we cut to the, the, the teenage couple walking around the corner mm. of this building, and they're at saying, did you like that song? Yes, I like that song. Whatever mm. that is. Maybe they were listening to Nine Inch Nails. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, anyway, yeah. They, they're, they're, they're – <laughs> Nice. <laughs> and you know she she loved that song. Let me tell you. No, but anyway, so they they were walking. They're walking along, and she sees a penny, and she says, "Oh, uh, heads up! That means good luck." Uh, what's interesting? We've seen coins with heads up uh, mm. wow. in earlier parts of this. But here's a very very curious thing. Now, just quick aside. I don't want to bore everybody with this, but I I I, I do have the the very. Um, wonderful uh, experience of having been to the, the premiere and the cast of the, of the new show was, was there in Los Angeles and you know, we're at a party afterwards. And there was a gentleman there who looked like Abraham Lincoln. And, uh, and, and I think Josh Eisenstadt said to me, yeah, that guy's famous for portraying Abraham Lincoln and he's in the show. Wow. And I thought, well, that's weird. Why is Abraham Lincoln in the show? Uh, but who knows? I think she might have a, you know, some sequence of affair, and there's a Lincoln impersonator. I, who knows? I mean, my mind was kind of spinning off all kinds of weird ideas, and I accepted it. <laughs> so, well, the, that gentleman who is famous for his Lincoln impersonation was the woodsman who appeared with the cigarette and who says, got a light. Hmm. That was that actor. Wow. Now, she picks up that penny and rubs her finger over the Abraham Lincoln image. And it's right after she does that that he descends from the air. Now, that could just be Lynch having fun with it and making a, an outside connection. Saying, yeah. You know, I've got this guy, this actor who does this all the time, and I'll have her rub the penny, and, and then he appears. But it is very curious that it's, it's that guy. And so, um, uh, so, but that's what happens. She rubs that penny, mm. and then he comes out of the sky and lands on the ground. Now, of course, the other woodsmen do too. They also yeah. seem to appear at that moment when she finds the penny. Yeah, and then, yeah, like an old 1950s horror movie, they kind of, uh, uh, you know, almost terrorize the, mo- the friendly motorists <laughs> going down the road. Uh, <laughs> and, so, um, and then anyway, the, I just wanted to put that yeah, little that's, bit of information. No, that's, that's pretty, really so, interesting. That's that is so, interesting. Yeah. It's like a little nod, yeah. right? And so eventually the woodsman gets his radio station, and, uh, you know, he's... <laughs> very creepy, very creepy. yeah. <laughs> and, I mean, he's killing people, squishing their heads. Very, um, you know, Lynchian, like, a lot of squishy noises and the blood, <laughs> and it's great. And then, he, and then he takes over the radio station, and he says that uh, this is the water, this is the well, drink full and descend. The horse is the white of the eyes and dark within. Very cryptic. Yes, creepy. Very creepy. I almost thought of the waterfall. I almost thought of the, you know, the falls and Twin Peaks. And then I thought of the white horse that Sarah mm, Palmer sees. Definitely. Um, but beyond that, I, yeah, it's just creepy. See, here's, here's my here's read on it, and I don't know if this makes any sense at all. You guys tell me. So the white of the eyes. Don't they equate the idea of the white of the eyes of someone who's very, very afraid? You know, you, mm. their eyes, you know, you, you see. And so that's the only thing I, I connected with it was fear. Yeah. The white of the eyes is fear. And, of course, fear connects back to the stories of past Twin Peaks. Mm. So I, it's, it's a loose uh, connection. It doesn't necessarily hold yeah. together. But um, the horse is the white of the eyes. And what is the white of the eyes? I just thought that it was the expression of fear. Wow. Mm. Interesting. And it's funny that your old series, I mean, from uh, episode 29 – we had all these people with white eyes in the Black Lodge. Yes. And then we have mm. Mr. C now with black, with black eyes. eyes. But, I mean, again, it's interesting, the whole eyes. I thought he was wearing contacts to, to conceal the white eyes. Because I was like, it's interesting he has dark eyes and not white eyes. Right. But then then all the people listening to this radio, they collapse. I don't know if they're dead or they just collapse. The, the little girl, she she falls over into her bed. I mean, she doesn't seem to be dead because of what happens at the end. Yeah, they just but seem to. But it's interesting that... That what he's saying, even maybe he, it doesn't matter what he's saying, but it's almost it strikes like, fear. It strikes fear, or brings, yeah. it, it makes people collapse. Yeah, something very deliberate is happening here. I mean, this creature descends. He takes over a radio station. He sends out this message, which causes people to to fall over. Uh, he does not stop chanting that uh, that sequence of phrases until mm. the weird uh, creature has 
uh, you know, gone into the mouth of the girl and it enters into her mouth and, and, and then she closes her mouth. And uh, it's only after that that he stops. Them. And so you, you get the implication that he was there for that purpose to mm. perhaps uh, allow that creature to find a host. Uh, yeah. You just put everyone mm. to sleep. And it, 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 uh, whether or not she was the one they wanted or whether or not it was just whoever was closest to the creature uh, mm. is, um, is unclear. Uh, I, there does seem to be, again, the most subtlest of indications that she might have been important uh, because she found the penny. Uh, but um, other than that, I think you know, there was a plan in place here to, to put people to sleep so this thing could find a host. Yeah. Any clue on who could she be with with the little clues they gave us? Uh, I, you I, know, I I've heard a lot of that. stuff on the internet. I don't like any of it. No. Um, yeah, me neither. Say it's Sarah Palmer. It, it doesn't make any. Again, if we're going to continue the story the way we ex, we've we've we experienced it so far, what, what we know happens in Twin Peaks, it doesn't make any sense. However, again, there is the potential that this story is going to is going to slightly uh, deviate. Mm. Um, but again, it's way too early to tell, and I really don't yeah. want to, to commit to that. But um, I don't know who that is. No, uh, yeah. I don't think she's important. I, 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 oh, I think she may be important, but I don't know if it's any character we've ever met before. Yeah, um, right. You know, again, at the right age for those two, the boy and the girl, to potentially be – uh, you know, one of the adults of Twin Peaks. So it's Sarah and Leland Palmer. I've heard that, and there's no evidence to support it, and there's certainly no evidence that says, you know, definitely not it. But um, uh, I, I, I think we just have to wait yeah, and yeah. see. My my hope is that the stories continue because there's just so much good story already happening with in Twin Peaks and everything else going on. I hope it continues, but I hope this is kind of like foreshadowing what might be coming in the future. I'm mm. hoping that maybe this is we're getting a little sense of the Woodsmen and what they've done, and maybe other things that have happened in the past, and maybe we're gonna see. It's a setup. I get it's a setup. yeah, maybe. like and they're giving us information about these creatures we've seen. We, we've seen them twice, and we're like, what are they? Now we know. Mm -hmm. So now I think they can continue telling the second half of this, this story. Yep. And I kind of feel like this was the, you know, uh, what was Lynch's quote about the donut uh, before the show started? It was, uh, it, was mm. a, it was the, um, something about the hole. I don't uh, know. What was the quote, right? Ah. And I think about yeah. this episode was this, the jelly-filled center, <laughs> the good part. Like, when you eat a donut, you eat it, and you get to the center. Oh, this is so good. Yes. And then you go to the end. So now we're, we're at that center, the oh, juicy boy. center. <laughs> and now we're going to go to the end. Guess what, though? There was more than jelly in there because I didn't expect what was in there. Yeah, jelly. I know. Can you the, – the, the look on Ben, my face, when all we, me and him are texting what's going to happen, and Scott, Ryan texting me, and then this is out of – Left field. Left, I, I, right, uh, up and down field, oh not gosh. even expected. It's great. Yes. <laughs> not what I expected. I, I, do, I do think this is uh, – obviously, it's a critical – uh, episode. I think this is the episode that uh, is going to define what's come before and what's coming. And I think yeah. you know it is it is positioned very very close to the middle of the storyline. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think I really do think that this could very much. I mean, it could very much redefine um, the Laura Bob relationship. And you mm. know. It, you know, let's let's assume that there is no change or deviation in the timeline. If the timeline is going to continue the way it, we know it does, even if that's the case, um, it still makes you realize that the, 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 the original Twin Peaks was this tiny, narrow view of this much larger, larger story that Laura Palmer was a far more significant mm. uh, being than just a teenager in a town, and that Bob himself may have been much more significant being than just sort of a, a wild demon who kind of got loose from his master. So mm. I, I, obviously this, is, this, is, this episode is giving us some background into the mythology of Twin Peaks, the woodsmen are extremely important, mm -hmm. and uh, you know these forces that are at play. And 
you know, hopefully the, the rest of the show will allow us to piece some of this together and get a better sense of the, the larger scheme yeah. that is the world of Twin Peaks. Uh, you know, we're in brand new territory now. Yeah, yes. It's exciting. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> very much. Uh, did you notice that the, at the very, very end, uh, the, the woodsman walks off into the, into the darkness and there's a very distinct sound of a horse uh, whinnying. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, yeah, you hear you the hear, horses. Oh, yeah. Wow. yeah. Yep. You hear the horses. It's weird how this shapes what we know and yes. what we don't know. That, no, that, that, that is exactly right. I think this, this part, this hour that we saw, reshapes how we look at all of Twin Peaks. Yeah, uh, definitely. Now. I really, definitely. I think this this is the reorienting episode, and mm. whether or not the story continues exactly as uh, we hope it does. You know, the story that we saw in the original series. Um, again, Mark Frost's book hints that maybe it's going to be different, uh, but um, whether it goes one way or the other, this is the episode that reshapes how we look at uh, reshapes the narrative. Mm. Yeah. So. You know, I'm, it, yeah. I'm hoping this is that this is the, the the line where we suddenly see the good is going to start winning. You know, we we brought out Laura in this orb, and she's descended into the world, <laughs> and maybe this is where we actually uh, start fighting back against and the I, evil. I, I think you're right, Ben, because we've seen we've seen all of a sudden now the Red Room helping uh, uh, Dougie out, uh, you know, uh, Cooper, right, Cooper the, yeah. helping him out with it, with his life, and if we if we look the whole overall art the whole overall series the giant has always helped cooper i mean oh, the yeah. giant helped him out in the first the second right, season right. with the clues and then he was at the roadhouse saying you know it's happy you know he's right. waving at him so it, it kind of feel like this trend of the giant you know pushing the people to say you got to go this way you know what you just reminded me of there was there's so way back at the beginning of the second season the giant talks to uh cooper in the bed and uh, firstly, he, he says, you know, where have you gone? So I always thought that led us to believe that we're not actually in the, the Great Northern anymore, like that whole mm. light. But there's a moment where the, where the giant actually, I think he puts out his hand, and there's almost like a beam of light or that goes into Cooper. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, oh, it makes me think of this whole right. orb thing. or it, like It's interesting, interesting that it's another mm-hmm. light. I, I need yeah. to think more about it, but there's this definitely seems to be this the, light. That the is, giant is a key. Yeah. Definitely a big or key. Oh, yeah. You're not the giant. <laughs> Whatever his name is. Actually, what I've been thinking about is like, I wonder if they're putting question marks because it could still be the giant, but maybe he actually has a real name. Like maybe at some point we're gonna learn, like who oh, he, who he really is. That's a like, good. That's the a giant good. was named by Cooper. Cooper is the one that said, "Hey, there was this giant." In right. My, in yeah. My, that's not his name. That's very true. I mean, it was the Co- it was Cooper who basically gave him the the identifier, the giant, and so. Uh, yeah, we don't know what his name is or what his uh, title is or right. whatever they're yeah. going to refer to him as. Uh, but I, I, I expect that those question marks will be replaced by letters uh, uh, later on, and we'll get it. Yeah. I mean, well, I hope we do. I, th- I think they're kind of hinting that we will. I think so. Yeah. And at, in, in the beginning of part one, we have – Cooper sitting in a chair, neck, and right across from it is, is not the giant. But I swear that's the same space that we saw in this episode where the woman was sitting down yeah. at the very beginning. Yes. That's where Cooper was sitting down. So it's interesting that Cooper has yeah. been in this space. Mm-hmm. I always thought that it might be the future. We, we He actually might not have done this yet. Yeah. I, I my, my impression right now is that um, – uh, Cooper, that was a that was a Cooper, a different Cooper, a Cooper uh, maybe of the future, mm. or um, I, I like to think that it's, it's Cooper is an agent of the White Lodge. Wow. So he's Agent Cooper, mm. and 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 that beginning sequence was uh, Cooper being sent out on a mission because mm. uh, the the giant yeah. says here's all the stuff, and I think Cooper says I understand. Yes, yeah, very and clearly. Then he very, disappears. Yes. And, yeah, yeah, it, and it, I I sort of read that as the giant saying, look, you know, here's, here's, here's your mission. <laughs> you know, here's your case file, agent Cooper. And then <laughs> Cooper goes off to, to work, whatever he yeah. has to do. It, and, maybe... and so, uh, it, it could be that we'll see an actual third or fourth, but a third Cooper, maybe, um, who is, you know, who's sort of the Cooper we know, maybe he's a, 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 somebody who's, who's, uh, manipulating events himself hmm. yeah and maybe dougie uh he's meant to move dougie to get 
to where he's mm-hmm. got to go. Maybe yeah. Dougie's life is going to connect us to something. Somewhere, yeah. somehow, Dougie you wonder, is going to bring us somewhere. You know, the forces that are guiding Dougie, whether or not that is the Cooper of the first scene, uh, who is basically saying, you know, I need this. This has got to happen. This Dougie's got to to live. And so I'm, uh, and I'm just thinking out loud here, but I'm going to help him. You know, I'm going to send him signals. I'm going to make mm. sure that all the problems in Dougie's life are fixed. So he yeah. doesn't get killed. And in fact, when you get attacked by Ike, the spike with the gun, I'm going to inhabit Dougie for a minute, and I'm going to, you know, I'm going to knock Spike Ike out, whatever his name is, <laughs> knock him yeah. out, yeah, and then and then he and then he withdraws again Interesting. from, mm. from Dougie. I, yeah. I don't know why, but, but some force is guiding him, and uh, that seems like a good choice. That maybe it's this futuristic or otherworldly uh, coup. Yeah, yeah, I definitely. So, it's it's just so many questions. So, so, yeah, it was a great episode though. I, <laughs> yeah, it was really something else. It definitely. I didn't expect it. I thought no, we were... nobody did. <laughs> and thank you so much, John, for coming on the show to talk about what your thoughts on this. And uh, I know we're gonna have a lot more to talk about. In the, yeah, in the future, definitely. Yeah, oh my gosh! I mean, it. Uh, uh, we are uh, we are the luckiest people mm. alive, really. Oh my <laughs> in gosh! Terms of, in terms of uh, you know a, a fan base yeah. that uh, embraced a, a certain fictional story, and to have uh, it given to us again in mm. this way, uh, it just. I mean, I you know, I, you think back on all the different people or you know different fan bases. You know, they got Star Trek back, and they got all their. Various shows come back, and we are so lucky. I mean, to get yeah. something like yeah, that, definitely. to have uh, two creative people like uh, David Lynch and Mark Frost uh, be allowed to tell the story like like this. So, so you and I and you know everyone, we can talk about it forever. And I mean, we'll be talking about this for decades. Yes. And, yeah, I mean, that's yeah, just great. That's sure. I mean, how lucky are we? We are so lucky. I know I pinch so. myself every day. It's like, oh my gosh, we've got new Twin Peaks. And we've got twin, yeah. new Twin Peaks for the next, you know, m- few months. I mean, that's crazy. Right. It's and we so get good. to, you know what? I, I like, though, we all get to enjoy the ride together. Yeah. And we get to pick it apart and talk about it and theorize right. it together, which is. You know, it's like, right. I think that's a lot of fun. It makes it a lot of fun. Definitely. So. so, you know, the president of Showtime, David Nevins, had said way back before the show came back, he was saying <laughs> that it was going to be pure heroin, heroin of Lynch. And at the time, I was like, what is he talking right. about? Like, yeah. it's just such a weird quote he said and then you see this episode it's like oh yeah this is what he, this is what he's talking about this is like this is like lynch can do whatever he wants he's gonna go out there and do the crazy stuff and this is it this, this is, is it this is what he's talking about yep oh, yeah oh my yeah. gosh uh yeah well, well thank you john thank, yeah, thank you, you so much for your time can yeah you t- tell people where can they find you tell them what you're working on sure uh well uh they can find me on twitter's the best place which is at Thorn Whip, and uh, well, you know, my blog, which I haven't time to work on at all, which is above the store.blogspot.com. Uh, but right now, really, I am focused fully on Twin Peaks. I'm writing synopses and notes and what analysis I can, given what we've got, uh, for uh, the Blue Rose magazine, which mm. people can go look for the Blue Rose. We've got issue one and two out. Yeah, uh, and uh, they've been fairly successful. We're really happy with working with Scott Ryan, who uh, you know does uh, the bulk of the work on this this project. So all credit to him. Uh, but we are trying to put together some sort of episode guide that has some substance and value to it. And I think right now I don't think I'm giving it any way. The plan is basically to do it in two parts. We were mm. going to try to get all 18 into one issue and then have it out to the printer by September, but Scott and I were talking the other day, and we're like, how can we possibly (laughs) really uh, 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 analyze this properly? Like I said, it's going to take years and years, but we want to get at least something of substance out. So I'm working on that. Uh, Issue three will be out uh, this fall, and issue four shortly after that. And then I have a book, uh, The Essential Wrapped in Plastic. Uh, I think most of the people who are listening know about that. It's, uh, It's available on Amazon, and it is a pretty substantive analysis of the original Twin Peaks. It's a must-have book if you're into Twin Peaks. Must it is have. must-have. <laughs> yes. Thank you, John Thorne, for being on today's show. What an amazing episode. What an amazing podcast today. 
We're going to be talking about that episode for years to come. We don't know what's going to happen next, but that episode just really changes the way we talk about Twin Peaks. Mm. It changes a lot. I mean, the gl- gloves are off. Lynch can do whatever he wants. And Showtime's it's, money. It's Showtime's money. <laughs> and I think they're embracing it. I think Showtime yeah. is totally embracing what they're doing, and I love it, and I can't wait to see what happens next. And um, briefly, I mean, we both love the episode. It, it's a lot to take in. Mm. Um, did you have any small gripes with anything about it? Did you have any, like, critique, anything you could change that ma- you didn't really care for in this Honestly, one? I don't. Like, I, so watching it with my wife, I was, like, watching this, like, Oh boy, this is the whole episode. So at first, like you know, at first you kind of realize, oh, this is not going to be your typical show. So I, mm-hmm. I had concerns at first, but I love two thousand one Space Odyssey, and I love that idea of just like let's just go with the flow, let's just embrace the imagery and just take it all in and just enjoy totally this. So I, no, I wouldn't change a thing. And you're more of a Nine Inch Nails uh, fan than I am, and but I, 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 I do love them more. I do love Trent Reznor more. After Lost Highway, but mm-hmm. I was never a huge fan. But I love that too. I love that whole scene there. It worked. I, I, I think, thought it worked. There's nothing I would change. There's absolutely yeah. nothing I would change. I was, you know, there's so many, even like the '50s piece. At the, I was like, okay, we're, is, is this kind of weird and stuff? But I loved it. I mean, you would you change anything? Um, so, I guess I didn't. Pr- I didn't say it well when we were talking to John. Um, for me, the only two things is so minor, and it's. It's stupid, and maybe in uh, after the whole thing, I won't even care anymore. But just seeing I, uh, Bob's face and then Laura's face on those orbs, mm-hmm. for me, I felt like there was a little too much hand-holding. I would have liked it if we just saw a black orb come out of Mr. C, and that black orb we saw floating towards us, and when they froze it, you just knew. That was Bob. And then How would you know it was Bob, though? Well, because we saw it coming out of Mr. C's body. Maybe you just saw some weird things. Or I know. I, yeah. I think it was more to show us. And I right. I feel like with Lynch, I love the mystery. I love the non-hand well, it's still a mystery. I, we still yeah. don't know where it's going. But I understand what you're saying. I, it didn't bother me. Yeah. I kind of It made more sense to say, oh. And that whole thing, I mean, I was touched by the idea of Laura in this orb and this woman kissing it. Yeah. It's almost like she's like a mom. And she's like, my child is going into the world. Yeah, I, I thought, yeah, I like I liked it, Laura, but wouldn't have been a baby picture of Laura as a baby? Like, just seeing a baby in there would be kind of cool. Yeah, but, but I, don't why think, was I don't think it is the birth of Laura Palmer. I, I know. I think it's the spirit. I think this is a continuation of Laura from all the, her life. I mean, I, I do think that she was the Laura Palmer was sucked up out of the Red Room and now is in this orb and and it was like sucked up and basically came out of uh, not the giant's brain. Yeah. And now yeah, we're getting yeah. Laura, her essence, her spirit, and say, okay, go go into the world. So Fair I enough. think if we saw a baby, we would get confused to think that this is her starting over. Mm. Which I know we've talked about. It could be a reboot, rebirth, or reboot. But I feel it's a or just it's just giving us what happened in the past. Right. We don't know. But for me. Minor. Those are the two minor things. I just like the ambiguity of good versus evil, not putting a face on it. But like I said, you know what? At the end of the day, I still absolutely loved it. Yes. I loved it. Good stuff. I can't wait to see what happens next. We have got to get out of here. We do. We have no community feedback this week because I just want to say thank to everybody who posted. We got the most comments shares and likes this week because of this episode Hmm. and i thank everybody and i just want to remind everybody be nice to each other on social media um because it's a great community we want to keep it that way so that'll be my only thing to say this week thank you again to jewel and counter esperanto podcast for recording the poem for us and especially Carl Sr. Carl Sr. did that. Thank you. That was so cool. They are awesome that they would take the time to record that. You can give us an email at twinpeaksunwrapped at gmail.com. If you got a comment, theory, or question, like us on Facebook. Let's hit 900. And follow us on Twitter at Twin Peaks Unwrap. And we're on Google Play. iTunes, five-star review, please. And give us those, com- those great comments. And... Um, I guess we'll be back next week. Next week. We we can tell you what's going to happen next week. We're going to try to get out earlier than usual. Next week, we're going to have Mark Givens from Dear Metal Radio. We are going to follow up on our predictions. Ooh, that yes. sounds good. And we're going to have Joel Bacco on. Because kind of like the old days where we would get, we would do a bunch of, uh, we, you and I would talk about some episodes, and then we have Joel on to yep. kind of follow up. follow up on yeah. that. Yeah, so, very exciting. exciting. Yeah. 
All right, see you next week. I'll see you in the trees. I'll see you in the trees. Under the cigar.